Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 395, featuring the first in a brand new series of interviews with Leonard Boyarski, one of the great artists and designers of RPGs. He's worked on Stonekeep, uh, Fallout, Arcanum, and many, many more games, and it's a real honor for me to have him on the show. We've got a lot to cover here, so uh, actually before we get started with that, I want to uh, say a quick shout out to... Uh, Lars Dickfinger uh, for helping me uh, to set up and arrange this interview. So thank you uh, very much, Lars. All right, so with that said, and without further ado, here is Mr. Leonard Boyarski. All right, folks, I am here today with the great Leonard Boyarski. He's an artist and video game designer who's uh, worked for Interplay, Troika, Blizzard, and Obsidian. Companies I'm guessing you're familiar with if you've ever watched, I don't know, a single episode of Matt Chat. <laughs> uh, he's been involved in many of the games we've covered here. Uh, he's worked on Fallout, Stonekeep, Arcanum, uh, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. He's also the senior world designer for Diablo 3 and uh, Reaper of Souls. And uh, by the way, Leonard, thank you for all the work you put into these games. I've had a lot of fun thanks to you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, so we're very excited to have you on uh, Matt Chat. I've been wa wanting to have you on for quite a while, actually. And we've got a lot of stuff here to cover, but uh, I thought we could start with this talk you gave at Portugal. I think it was called, is that the Sinfo uh, tech yeah. conference? And You know, one of the things, there's a lot of great moments in that, but one, I, I don't know what to make of this. It really kind of floored me. My jaw was like on the floor. Uh, when you're up there in front of this group and you're talking about Fallout and and all this stuff, and you, you, you're you talking about that little intro movie and how great it was and how that came together, and you at one point asked the audience, you know, how many people here have seen uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, that little movie? And I was expecting, you know, everybody's hand to shoot up and a big cheer and everything. Yeah. Uh, and instead it was more like, you know, they didn't know what, you know, it seemed like they didn't know what you were talking about. And that for me was just kind of one of those moments of, you know, people just aren't getting, uh, people just don't treat video game classics uh, the same way they do movie classics or, or music, you know, classics. Uh, you know, I was watching you talk about Fallout. I was thinking it was like watching George Lucas talk about Star Wars. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, what's going on with that? Why is it that, you know, movies, ath athletics, whatever, they get all of the attention and, and great game designers are just pretty much uh, unknown? I do not know. Um, and I agree with you. That does seem to be the way it's, it is in our culture. But with that, it was a little bit of a different situation. I think it was cultural to a certain degree. Um, I made some jokes during the presentation that I thought were great. <laughs> um, and I got polite um, laughter or, or smattering of applause. Um, but they're very receptive. They're all very, very, um, very polite and very nice. Um, afterwards, I spent about, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour answering questions. Wow. Um, and they all had follow up questions, except for one guy who said, um, his favorite game was Stonekeep, and his favorite creature was the tentacle creature that was the first 3D creature <laughs> ever made, which is the first time I've ever heard that in you know my 25 years of making games uh, that someone said Stonekeep was their favorite game. Um, so with that instance, I think it was cultural and possibly some language, um, but it was it was a little weird. But I, I felt very good about it, and the people there were really great. It was it was all run by students. Which was really impressive because it was just everything was smooth about it. There was no hiccups, there was no um, no hassles at all. It was just it was this really run, really well run um, symposium that they had there. Well, you did a really great job. I'll post some links to this in the show notes if anybody would like to, to go watch this. It's about about well, an thanks. hour long. Uh, yeah, I posted watching. one. Oh, sorry. Uh, they posted for some reason the video they put up originally has no slides on it. It's just me talking in front of a white background. So I actually, somebody had posted a different version of it. Um, so I actually edited it down. So my, there's actually a version up there with the slides now, which is probably like better because it's not just looking at me talking about stuff. You could actually see what I'm talking about. Okay. Well, I'll make sure to post a link to the right one. So I know people <laughs> that watch this, I want to go and uh, watch that too. Thank you. Uh, well, let's get in a little bit into your history, Leonard. I know you've got some a couple of different college degrees. You've got background in illustration as well as art. 
Uh, but it seemed like he kind of learned how to do the computer graphics side of it. Not really in school, but just kind of on your own. What if you could kind of flesh that out a little bit? And I'm also curious, because you mentioned a couple times in that talk how these more traditional skills are really just were extremely useful in a lot of uh, situations where I wouldn't have thought it would have anything to do with, uh, <laughs> you know, making computer graphics. So I just wonder if you could pick up some of those points. Sure. Uh, well, what happened was I went to first went to Cal State Fullerton um, for a degree in illustration. And when I was getting to the end of that, um, I don't even know what year that was. So that must have been like 88. And um, I just didn't feel confident enough. And I was in a band actually at the time with a guy who was going to Art Center, which is a very, uh, very well-known, reputable uh, art school in Pasadena which for those not familiar is not very far from, from Fullerton and where I lived. And so I started going there. And by the time I was re literally the semester, uh, two semesters before I graduated, they first got a computer lab. Um, so I was like, great, my last semester, I want to take some computer art courses. And they're like, well, you can't do that first. You have to take an intro to computers class. And I'm like, I'm not going to take an intro to computers class in my last semester here. Um, so I left with only actual paintings, acrylic paintings, um, oil paintings. And then I tried to get some freelance work, wasn't able to do that. And through some of the friends that I had gone to Art Center with who are now working for Buena Vista Software, which is a division of Disney, uh, they got me a freelance job uh, working on a game that got canceled fairly quickly. But um, the guy who was uh, the key guy there uh, really liked working with me. So he hooked me up with Quicksilver. Um, oh, no, the, the original game was with Quicksilver. And he hooked me up with some other guy uh, to make this game called uh, Unnatural Selection. But the thing about uh, my the the education I got, um, there's a lot of stuff, uh, whether it comes to 3D art or just general art, it's the same principles. Uh, you know, the way you compose a picture, lighting, all that stuff is the same regardless of what your medium is. But I think the thing that really helped me the most in the, what my career turned out to be was Art Center really tells teaches you a lot about um, how to frame things in a bigger sense um, in terms of building, like if you're even if you're just doing an illustration, thinking about it on all these different levels and which a lot of that kind of information really is helpful when you're building IPs. I went and saw this talk by, I can't remember the guy's name, at GDC a couple years ago. Um, I guess he has a company that they do actual uh, – uh, IP creation, or they they help people develop IPs as, as part of their business. And he went down the list of what makes a great IP and how to build a great IP. And it was a really great talk, but I was like, wow, I've heard this all before. And it wasn't until afterwards that I realized that guy went to Art Center, and this is like the basic Art Center curriculum. Um, so a lot of that stuff came in really handy when I was, you know, we were making Fallout and we were doing Arcanum. And when you're building stuff from scratch, a lot of those things apply, whether you're you're thinking in different ways about building a picture um, like, how are you going to um, evoke a specific world? Like, especially if you're creating something from scratch, like a science fiction world, how are you going to evoke that? Uh, how are you going to get across um, in one still image everything that you're trying to get across? And a lot of that stuff just carries over when you're making a video game or when you're making an IP, whether it would be for a movie, a book, a painting, or a video game. Well, sounds like a great reason to go to Art Center, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's, and they and they're really um, and they weren't even geared towards computer art at the time. I think um, I said in my talk, um, my senior advisor um, when I told him I was getting into the video game industry was kind of like, "Well, you know, keep at it. You'll get a you'll get a real art job one day." Oh. Uh, and I think Tim had the same experience. I think when Tim talked to you, he might have mentioned that you know when he left academia or computer science. Um, his advisor said basically the same thing, like, why are you doing this? You shouldn't be going to computer games. There's no future there. Um, so it really was a time when people were just like, why would you want to do computer games? Um, but I, I was just happy I had a job that was paying me money to do art. Do you think that attitude is lessened somewhat? Yes, I think so. But I mean, because like what I said about Art Center, I didn't finish my thought, was that they now have uh, full-on degrees even geared towards doing um, entertainment art or specifically computer art, um, which kind of uh, puts all that stuff together that I learned in a variety of classes. Um, the difficult thing about when I went there uh, was it was before there was obviously a lot of computer art being done, but also it was kind of a period of time where very, um, not quite fine art, but very impressionistic, very, um, uh, the more painterly, the less, 
um, detailed, the the less uh, Norman Rockwell esque, I guess you would say, uh, <laughs> art was really stylized. Was really the popular thing when it came to advertising art or freelance art. And I'm like, that's all really cool. I like the way it looks, but I'm much more interested in doing stuff that's much more solid, much more based in um, a lot of detail, a lot of like um, delivering that kind of thing um, that you would find in a in a video game or in any kind of uh, you know medium like that. And um, so I kind of had to search out those classes where now they have a curriculum that's geared specifically towards that, from what I've heard. Well, another one of the insights from that talk that really intrigued me, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase, sort of put this into my own thoughts here. You, it sounded like you were saying that uh, a lot of graphic artists, if you're really doing your job well, uh, then people don't even notice it. You know, so it just looks natural and nobody really notices. Well, they have no idea how much work went into making it look, quote unquote, natural. <laughs> well, there, of, there is yeah. there is a bit of that. But I, what I was specifically referring to is I have this tendency to focus on things that um, don't seem to matter <laughs> much to people in the end. They don't even notice it. Like, for instance, um, in Fallout, we had to palette everything down to 256 colors, actually less than that, because we had certain parts of the palette reserved for specific things. Um, so you'd get this really uh, pixelization crawl where um, pixels would crawl over the surface of of uh, whatever art you were doing. And instead of it being just random, I tried to figure out how that worked and use that to kind of evoke the dirty, gritty style of Fallout, um, which, no, I was I was really proud of it. No one ever noticed it. They noticed that it was kind of grungy looking. Um, and I think at the time people thought that was just bad art. Um, I think and now people look back on it and think, oh, it's oh, got this wow. really great feel towards it. Gritty feel. Um, yeah, but at the time, I think people looked at it and were just like, well, it looks kind of crappy. Um, and also, the other thing I did, which me and Tim joke about all the time, is we spent a lot of time making sure that your feet, the character's feet don't slide in Fallout. Like, if you look at Fallout, the character's feet are cemented to the ground, which we were really proud of. Like if you look at um, the original Diablo, the characters are skating around. No one cares. I mean, it was just one of those things that you know, being new to the uh, new to being an art director, new to running a project, we were a lot of times I was focusing on things that um, were not all that important in the end. Um, so that's kind of what I was saying there uh, was that I personally have a tendency to end up focusing on things that don't really matter in the end. I think they do. I think they're subconscious in a little ways, or maybe even subliminal. Where um, certain things, like for instance, I think one of the really cool things that I'm proud about in Fallout, a uh, proud of in Fallout, is that like everywhere you turn, there's something that kind of evokes the world. Whether it's the loading screens, whether it's the town maps, uh, the manual, the um, box cover, we had uh, this 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 really um, you know uh, deep theory about how we were going to make all of these things fit together to give you the feeling of the world, not just what you were seeing in the game. Um, so that kind of thing, I think, resonates, but I don't think people realize the amount of work that goes into those kind of things. Yeah, that's one of the yeah. things I, when I reviewed the game, uh, <laughs> I kept comment, coming back to that point, how everything from the menu there, the, all the different screens, it all feels coherent. Yeah, even to the manual. I mean, most games nowadays, I don't even know if they have manuals. <laughs> uh, but the Fallout yeah. manual is kind of part of the, I think you kind of miss out on a key part of the experience if you don't have that manual. Uh, yeah, I would agree. I, I think that's I think it's a fantastic manual. And I was really, really um, happy that we were able to do that. Plus, it was uh, whatchamacallit. Uh, uh, it had the, the, the ring binding so that you could lay it flat, which was awesome. Yeah, the, the lost art of computer game manuals. We could do, <laughs> do a show on that. Yeah, just just come back to this point uh, one more time. I remember one of the things I think it kind of one up George Lucas coming back to him for a minute because I remember <laughs> uh, people talk about how what made Star Wars so cool was it instead of these nice clean you know ships everything looked kind of lived in kind of dirty and, and I was thinking the yeah. same thing with because one of the things you said about Fallout was it'd be easy to make the 3D graphics that look really shiny and uh, you know perfect uh, but it actually took more skill uh, to make them look dirty and on top of that you were actually doing that to kind of cover up a, a technological sort of turn that a bug into a feature. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't so much to cover yeah. it up because we did want it to be dirty and thrashed, yeah. which, I mean, I, I wouldn't say we won up to George Lucas. I think, you know, me and Jason were huge Star Wars fans, or at least the original um, Star Wars. And that was one of the, you know, the revelatory things about the very original Star Wars movie, which is now called A New Hope, 
is that everything was thrashed. It looked like a real world. Before then, whenever you had a science fiction movie, everything looked brand new and shiny. Um, so that just really, um, you know, resonated with us. And we really wanted to kind of bring that over. Um, plus, it's not it's not a great uh, leap to go, oh, we're making a post-apocalyptic world. It needs to be dirty and thrashed. So, Well, it definitely wouldn't feel the same if it, if it had that clean look you were talking about. So, uh, Another one of these things that you mentioned uh, in this talk I wanted to get into a little bit was uh, you said you took some philosophy courses, I guess, or you were yeah. studying philosophy, and that you said that kind of played a big role in, the, in your later game designs. And I was kind of curious about uh, which philosophers you were influenced by. I'm just going to guess maybe Plato and Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche a little bit. Uh, one of my best friends in high school was a big Nietzsche fan. I was really, um, I don't know, is Nietzsche's considered an existentialist. I think that, that really started with Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, but yeah, it was the, more the existentialist stuff that was very, um, you know, when you're, you're 18 and, and angst ridden, uh, that stuff kind of really speaks to you because it's, it's when you start realizing, um, you know, how much of the, the world, um, you know, society, everything about the world that you think is a very concrete thing, um, really talks about, you know, this is all ideas. This is all man-made stuff. It's just like when you get down beneath it, there's like, there's really nothing there. It's all it's all this stuff, these stories we tell ourselves, which is something I think I've been exploring in some way or another throughout my whole career. Whenever I get a chance to write this stuff or or, or create worlds, um, it always has a lot to do with um, the story people are telling about the world as much as what's going on in the world itself. One thing that was interesting, uh, Leonard, from your Wikipedia page, I don't know if you've looked that over how accurate it is, but... Uh, they were saying on there that you're really more of a comic book guy than a video gamer, but that you did love a couple of games, and they pointed out some of your favorites. Uh, Wizardry, which that game comes up. I think that's come up in pretty much yeah. every interview I've, I've done with RPG designers. But, uh, but also Lands of Lore came up. I just, do you feel like those games have influenced you? Um. Yeah, only because, I mean, I think Lands of Lore uh, just came at the perfect time for me. Wizardry was something where, um, even though it was those vector graphics a tiny in the tiny corner of your screen, um, it was just a great, it felt very like much like a D&D &D experience to me, even though it didn't have, you know, the depth of playing, you know, with actual live people. Um, just the, just the excitement of like, what's going to be around this corner? Oh, another vector graphic hallway. But somehow you would, you know, buy into that, especially, you know, you, you'd will yourself into that world and, and, and experience that lands of lore was just one of those games where I don't, it's like, I liked the art style. I just had a really get, great time playing it. It was, I think one of the reasons it remains uh, a fond memory for me is because that was, I played that when I was making stone keep. I didn't. I knew virtually nothing about making video games or how they were made. I was being told, especially at the beginning of it, you know, I'd give, been given a list of art. After I got away from cutting things out of backgrounds, I'd just be given a list of art to like do, make pixel art. Um, you know, here's some icons. Make us some icons. So that was like kind of the last game I played before I saw behind the curtain. So I was still able to kind of like get really involved in it and not be looking at it like a game designer and just be a, a pure fan about it. Um, and I really hadn't played a lot of games um, in between like Wizardry and Lands of Lore. So I think that that was when, um, you know, I'd played like like uh, Wolfenstein and I believe Lands of Lore was even before Doom because um, I think Doom was probably, you know, Doom was revel revelatory because of the whole multiplayer aspect to it. Um, but, yeah, those were Lands of Lore and Doom were probably the last two games I played before I really understood how the how the um, how the sausage was made, as they say. <laughs> You got to see how the sausage was made. So it sounds like that's kind of a bad thing, I suppose. Maybe once you see how games are made, they're not as much fun to play anymore? Uh, maybe a little bit, um, because you're always looking at it like that. Just like, you know, I obviously I've been doing uh, stories and writing for a long time as well. Um, so, you know, when you go to movies, you, people you go with are always like expecting you to just be like, well, I didn't like how they did the motivation for that one character. <laughs> Um, so there's a little bit of that, I think, in anything that you're watching. But I can still get um, sucked up into if something's good, you know, you can still get get, uh, you know, transported to this other world. Um, I don't think um, I wouldn't say it's ruined games for me, but I definitely look at them differently and I play them for different reasons than probably other people. 
Um, I actually find, to me, uh, making games is probably the ultimate game because there's no, you know, you're creating the game as you go. You're creating not only the game you're making, but it's almost like a meta game where you have to figure out how to get this thing done in a specific amount of time to, to, to do what you want it to do. Um, you know, the, the, the different things you have to accomplish when, it, when you're making a game are, um, are way more um, complex and uh, difficult than, you know, running to the next town over and grabbing something and running back to, to please your quest giver. Well, let's get into Stone Keep. You know, this is a sure. game I talked to Peter Oliphant had him on i guess it's probably been a few years uh, now uh, but he had a lot to say he gave us kind of the uh, version of the, sort of the behind the scenes of what went on there and it sounded like uh you know if i had to sum up his uh, his discussion it sounded like he kind of got a i guess it was, he's sort of a victim of bad timing i guess you could say uh that took so long for the they took so long to make the game that by the time it came out the the graphics engine already looked kind of dated, so they kind of ran into that issue a little bit. And then, uh, you know, I guess there was some political stuff going on. Uh, <laughs> nope, we don't necessarily need to get into all of it. But uh, I thought that kind of contrasted with some of the stuff I heard you saying about Airplay, how it was this wonderful sort of chemistry and everybody got along so well. And, you know, I'm just wondering, what, what was uh, Stonekeep like for you behind the scenes? Well, it all has to do with where I was in the company and um, my and my life, because when I came in, I like I said in that talk, I was really concerned. You know, I couldn't find a job doing freelance art. I didn't know what I was going to do to make a living. And then people started paying me to make video games. You know, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, I, I can't <laughs> believe this is happening. So, you know, I come in. They'd already been working on Stonekeep for maybe even two years. They'd been working on it for a while. Um you know, the backgrounds done by Rob Nessler, Obsidian Art Director, were fantastic. I mean, the first time you saw that was just like, oh, my God, look at those backgrounds when you're running down the hallways and and and, uh, and, the, and the rendering and, and the way everything looked was just so neat to see. So I come in, I'm immediately put on this game that looks really cool, not really happy with my job on it. Like, you know, cutting things out of background wasn't, wasn't necessarily um, my goal in life, <laughs> but I was also like, I'll go into, I'll spend eight hours cutting things out of backgrounds. You guys paying me good money. This is fantastic. I don't have to get a real job. So it was kind of like that enthusiasm. My first real job in the industry, like I had done unnatural selection as a freelance guy, um, but this was like, I was part of a team. I started learning how games were being put together. Um, I wasn't dealing with any of that side of it at all. By the time I started to get, go beyond cutting things out of backgrounds and I was doing icons and I started actually, you know, uh, interfacing a lot with the game director and the art director. Um, that was near the end of it. So I wasn't even um, like involved in all that politics. And it was so I was, you know, meeting people like Tim and Jason. I was just having a great time at work. Um, so I don't know how that was put together behind the scenes. I didn't know anything about coding. I didn't know anything about scripting. All I knew about or all I was learning about was art. So that's why it was great. I mean, I saw stuff going on on other teams that I was like, well, I'm glad I'm not on that team. Um, and especially that even accelerated while we were making Fallout. So I was kind of like in this little bubble. And then me and Tim and Jason created our own little bubble on Fallout. I mean, there was people who were very unhappy working on games like Descent to Under Mountain at the time. Um, and there was a lot of like they tried to make all these other divisions that were doing, you know, different games and all this weird stuff. And and I saw the stuff going on in other parts of the company, but for us, it was just like this little um, clubhouse that we had created. Um, so, you know, the great thing about Interplay was that we could create that and it had that vibe. Um, I almost feel like, and Tim talked about this a lot, I think. When he came on, I think he was the 40th employee or something like that. So it was a very small company. It was very, you know, tight knit. You were like 88 uh, or something. Like I was, that. yeah, I was somewhere in the 80s. So even when I started, it was still a really small company. And by the time it exploded and you had all this stuff going on that, that probably the people who came in at that point didn't feel all that great, um, we had taken what we thought was great about, about Interplay and kind of like, you know, put it in this time capsule or this bubble over on the side. Um, so I think that's why we had um, these great feelings. And I think Fergus. Um, you know, and the other guys who are running uh, Black Isle tried to kind of like create that or, or did create that for their division, you know, and then they made games like Torment, um, you know, and Icewind Dale. So they were able to kind of keep that interplay part alive. There was all these other divisions interplay that I don't think had that kind of feeling 
um, by the time we left. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week with uh, part two. There might be uh, two, three parts of uh, for this interview with Leonard. Uh, but there's a lot of great stuff. Actually, the best stuff is uh, yet to come. So you definitely want to stay tuned for that. We're going to get into Fallout and all that good stuff. So uh, anyway, I think you'll really enjoy that. So stay tuned. Uh, as always, I want to thank you. 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 Thank you, guys, for your support of the show. Could not do it without you. It's completely... Uh, fan-driven episodes. If you like uh, hearing from people like Leonard, you want to get the background story, uh, you want in-depth interviews like this, you have to fund the program uh, to keep these episodes coming. Uh, all I ask is a buck a show. Uh, you can do that over at the Patreon link in the show notes, or you can go to mattchat.us and look at some of the options. And uh, I wanted to mention with this one, if you want to buy uh, games from goodoldgames.com, uh, if you go to my matchat.us site, there's an affiliate link there. Uh, you can actually support the show that way. And that doesn't cost you anything extra. Uh, so that's a pretty cool option. Uh, but anyway, whatever you guys do to support the show, I really appreciate it. And just uh, one more thing. Uh, I'm working with uh, Robbie, a longtime uh, fan of the show, friend of mine, on something really, really, really super cool uh, for the longtime uh, Matt Chat supporters. Probably looking at... Uh, anybody with lifetime uh, support of $100 or more, uh, they're going to be getting something really amazing uh, here pretty quick. I'm still, we're still working out the fine, uh, uh, the fine details on that, but I know you, uh, you should be really excited about it. I really am. I don't want to spoil it uh, for you uh, other than to say uh, I think you will appreciate. <laughs> I wish I could just tell you what it is, but I, I should probably uh, keep it under wraps. I think it would be more fun as a surprise. But, but anyway... Uh, with all that not said, uh, what else? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> all right, got some uh, news here from Stig. Uh, he's writing in about this. New Fable game being developed at Forza Horizon Studio. Now this is a new uh, uh, Fable game with a story, character, focused open world action RPG uh, as opposed to the uh, spin-off games like Fable Legends or uh, Fable The Journey. Uh, however, there's a little bit of uh, mixed messages here. Apparently Simon Carter, one of the co-creators of Fable, is saying he's got mixed feelings about it. He says, it's a little curious to get rid of the team that is uniquely expert in making Fable and then try to make a Fable. Fable is a weird game and a tough one to deconstruct for a new team. So it sounds like he's got some misgivings there. Uh, anyway, let me know what you think. That's uh, Fable, new Fable game. Uh, Stig also wrote in about this. This, is, this has got me excited. This is a Railway Empire. And this is just about to be released January 26th. I mean, look at this thing. <laughs> Remember Sid Meier's, uh, uh, was a Railroad, and I actually played one called A-Train all the time on, on Amiga, but anyway, it's a Railroad, a railroad game, uh, elaborate wide-ranging rail network, 40 different trains modeled in extraordinary detail, says, uh, factories, tourist attractions, maintenance buildings, you know, I've always wanted to build a maintenance building, <laughs> so exciting. Uh, you also hire, manage a workforce, uh, develop over 300 technologies, Five eras of technological innovation. I mean, this thing sounds amazing. I mean, just go check out this trailer. Uh, this will be available on GOG. Uh, so I'm going to ask you guys, uh, don't please don't go to Steam and buy it on there. Uh, get it on GOG and use my affiliate link. I'll post there on the show notes. And that way, uh, you'll, again, you'll support the show. It won't cost you anything extra. It's the same game with uh, no copy protection either. So I think you'll like that. And then finally, Adam wrote in about this. Uh, Free-flying first-person shooter Forsaken, if you remember that one from back in the day. It's getting the EX treatment from the uh, Turok 1 and 2 HD update, guys. Uh, this one's going to be integrating much of the lost uh, Nintendo 64 content back into the PC version. Uh, adapted and remixed to fit the faster, faster twitchier PC editions gameplay. So it sounds like they, he's kind of taking the best of all these different versions of the game. Uh, and putting it into the new one. So that sounds really exciting. Uh, if you're a fan of Forsaken, I'm sure you'll, you're on top of this, but 
Uh, just in case you're not, uh, go check that out. And uh, thanks, Adam, for sending that in. All right, I think that'll do it for the news. What about that ale of the week? All right, so for this week, I got a funkier pumpkin. I'm kind of uh, keeping up with my little Brett theme here. This is a spiced sour ale with Brett. It's uh, brewed by Boulevard Brewing Company out of Kansas City, Missouri. So it should be available wherever you are. It's the Boulevard Smokestack Series special release. Really a uh, nice bottle on it. Never content with brewing to style, a brewer's approach to funkier pumpkin is far from your standard pumpkin spice beers. Uh, this one has, the, of course, the Breda, <laughs> Breda Nemices, or Brett, uh, fungus, or whatever that is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to complicate the flavor, a subtle pumpkin flavor is accented by traditional spicing in a beer that showcases the earthy notes of our house wild, uh, wild yeast strain. And so that's about all it says there. It's 8.5% uh, uh, alcohol by volume, so uh, not, not, it's not too bad. That's, that's a little, I guess that's about standard for these kind of ales. Uh, but anyway, I'm really excited about this. I love the pumpkin. That's one of my favorite kinds of uh, flavored ales, and I'm I'm just kind of uh, new to this whole sour ale business, so I'm not really sure what to expect here, but uh, let's get her open and see what it's all about. Oh, yeah, look at here. This is one of the ones with the fancy, the fancy uh, corks that come sh flying out. Let's see if I can hit you with it. <laughs> I don't know why this is so fun, but it's almost worth paying a little extra for these. All right, let's see if I can do it this time. Almost there. There we go. Boo! <laughs> now nah, right overhead. Uh, anyway, let's get this into the drinking horn and see what it's all about. I got some of this funk, uh, funkier pumpkin in the uh, rather excellent drinking horn here, and I, I have to say, this smells absolutely delicious. Definitely nothing funky ab about the aroma of this. You really smell that pumpkin. Uh, the pumpkin spice really comes through. Really vibrant. Kind of a citrusy uh, take on it too. Just does really smells really really good. I uh, just can't wait to get into this. So let's go ahead and give it a taste. Wow. Yeah, you get the. It's almost like a Belgian flavor uh, that hits you first, and you get the, the the pumpkin there on the back end. You get that sour taste. I'm kind of getting used to that now. Uh, it's almost. Uh, I kind of describe it like a champagne meets grapefruit kind of a flavor. And definitely sort of citrusy. Uh, let me try it again. Ah. Yeah, these are uh, the brats are definitely very uh, complex in terms of flavor. It's uh, kind of hard to describe it to me for me, but it's uh, you definitely taste I guess a sour kind of a grapefruit rind like flavor. Uh, the pumpkin is not actually very pronounced in this. You, you can sort of taste it uh, there towards the end. Uh, what I really noticed is when you first taste it, it's kind of a belgian -y, a citrusy flavor, and that gets replaced by that sour, uh, which I guess is the Brett uh, taste, and then a little bit of pumpkin on the end. So I think that's a pretty good uh, description of it for you. Uh, I'll try it one more time here. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good description. It's kind of almost like a, uh, maybe a little bit like a mead, almost. Uh, the pumpkin, definitely not very pronounced taste-wise. It's more of that sour, uh, sort of a citrusy uh, taste. You can sort of pick up on that uh, pumpkin there towards the end. Uh, I'm not going to say this is my favorite pumpkin ale by any means. Uh, I'm a big fan of the pumpkin, uh, if you remember that one. Uh, this one would probably be better if, you, if you're really into sour ales and you want just kind of a hint of a pumpkin uh, flavor this might be the the one for you. I'll try it one more time here Yeah, it's not bad Like I said, I'm not quite uh, <laughs> Sure what I think about these breads and the whole sour ale phenomenon yet, but uh, this one's pretty good I would probably go something like three out of five drinking horns on this one uh, as I said if you're a big fan of the sours if you love the breads and you know, that might be a thing for you, but generally for my purposes, if I see something called pumpkin, uh, I really want a strong uh, pumpkin flavor on it. So uh, for me, it's more of about a three out of five because you really don't taste uh, that much pumpkin. Uh, you smell it, but it's not really all the, uh, uh, it's not in the flavor. 
I just wanted a three out of five. Uh, definitely not a bad uh, ale, uh, but just not quite uh, there, in my opinion. The funkier pumpkin spice sour ale with Brett. All right, then, let's uh, wrap it up with the quotation. And um, uh, Leonard was talking a little, uh, a little bit there about Sartre. And I found a good quote from him I thought was appropriate somehow. It goes something like this. Only the guy who isn't rowing the boat has time to rock it. So ponder on that and see you guys next week. My calculations are correct. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit.